Emma and I'm from the Nova Center. Before we dive into our discussion on nourishing summer health, I wanted to let you know a little bit more about our center as well as tell you a bit more about our speaker, Dr. Noah Rubenstein. So UNOVA is an integrative wellness center acclaimed for its expertise in fertility and reproductive health. With three clinics in New York City and virtual services for people nationwide, we work in partnership with our patients to realize their full potential. We offer acupuncture, Chinese medicine, body work, and virtual consultations from the field's leading practitioners. And the Dr. Noah is a licensed acupuncturist, board certified clinical herbalist, and the chief clinic director here at UNOVA. Noah has been in practice since 1997 and draws on a wealth of experience to treat everything from reproductive health to respiratory conditions and more. With a Western medical background, as well as extensive training in Eastern medicine, Noah recognizes and uses the benefits of each to effectively treat his patients. Some of you submitted questions prior to this discussion, which we're really looking forward to diving into. If you have questions throughout, definitely feel free to pop them in the chat box and I can read them out for you. And with that, I'm gonna pass this over to Noah to get started. Thank you so much, Emma. And hello, everybody. Um, glad to see you all here. And welcome to the middle of the summer and our discussion on staying healthy and staying well and living in the seasons as we do through each season here, here at the center. Um, I hope everybody's doing great with the weather because we've had, we've had some very, excuse me, temperamental weather uh, and dogs. Uh, I apologize in advance for, for my pup that sometimes hears things and and make sure that we all know about it. Um, so what I wanna to do to kind of get into the conversation about the summer specifically is kind of backtrack. And we're gonna talk a little bit about Chinese medical theory because it's a great way to lay the foundation for how we understand the seasons, whether it's summer or winter or anything in between and how we can adjust our own lifestyles and behaviors and nutrition and exercise and so on to it. So. One thing that we should just all have a handle on is from the very beginning, everything that we talk about in Chinese medicine, every, everything that we've discussed and theorized over for literally thousands of years can get reduced or at least understood in terms of yin and yang. And this is particularly valuable in, in the conversation we're gonna have this evening. Just as a quick refresher, reminder of every, for everybody what yin and yang is. Yang is that symbol that we remember from like college dorm posters and stuff. It's the circle with the white side that has the black spot and the black side that has the white spot. And even though there's the element of each in the other one, what's really valuable and important to understand is that there's, there's no gray area. There's a constant transition from one side to the other from day to night, but there's really not much confusion between the two. There's, it's black or white with the elements and the potential of transformation from one into the other, but there's, there's no gray. So one of the ways that we can think about this is in terms of hot and cold with yin being the dark side of the mountain that's cooler and still and more material and yang being the sunny side that's warm and active and changing. And when we think about this in terms of our bodies, we can say that yin is the more material, foundational cooling part of our bodies and our metabolisms. And yang is the energizing, active aspect of, of that. So why do we talk about, why is this so important in our opening conversation, to open our conversation about the summer? We have, an understanding in Chinese medicine that we should live in harmony with the environment. When it's super hot outside, you should be warm inside. And when it's freezing outside, you should be warm inside. And we have this idea that external factors like hot and cold and dampness and dryness from the outside can lead to changes inside our bodies. And we recognize this as colds, flus, sickness, sunstrokes, things like that. But the idea is to live in harmony with the environment, but not to resonate with the environment. During this time of year, there are some things that we see happening in our own bodies and in other people that are really common. It's not 
it's not unusual for us to know somebody or for ourselves to feel overheated and yet sweating too much and yet dry and yet wanting to nourish ourselves voraciously and yet not having so much of an appetite. And it's this sort of combination of understanding yin and yang that leads to these things. And an external condition that we talk about in Chinese medicine that quite appropriately is called summer heat, right? It's not just the heat, but it's a particular kind of heat that happens during the summer when the warmth and the humidity come together and lead to this sort of constellation of signs and symptoms that don't always make sense on paper together, but that we can all feel. Again, things like dryness, but thirst and dry, but sweating profusely and feeling kind of warm and energized, yet at the same time, lethargic and with, with a reduced appetite. And so what happens is in a given summer, in a given season, there are two things that come into play. One, what we're exposed to through our lifestyle, through the environment around us, through the foods that we're eating. And we all also have our own constitutions. So one person may run on the less robust chi, more like slow appetites, slow metabolism, damp side. And during the summer, that stuff may become more evident. For another person, they run super hot, super dry, really active, and they may tend to have this more sort of dry, red, um, sort of withering sort of look to them. So the takeaway from this is that we wanna have an understanding not only of what's going on around us, but also what our nature is. And Chinese medicine is all about understanding those two things what our internal balance is and what our internal balance is in the context of wherever we find ourselves. This is in fact, the, the, one of the beauties of, of Chinese medicine, which is we understand our bodies as microcosms within the larger macrocosm. And that's how we maintain and rec how we recognize and maintain health, that, health and ways to take care of ourselves that are gonna be the most valuable. So just belaboring the theory stuff for one more minute, because actually I think many of you have expressed an interest in this. During the summer, we are in what's considered the fire element, right? And that makes sense because this is the hot time of year. This is when things are, are warm and active and changing and moving. And we'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about what the fire element is and what it means and what the season means. But this is one of five elements. And the five elements that we talk about in Chinese medicine are the five elements that make up the environment around us and our internal nature. And those five elements are wood, which we associate with the spring, fire in the summer, wood, fire, earth, which is kind of the early autumn, late summer, metal, which is the autumn itself, and then the winter, which is water. So each season has an element that is pretty predictably associated with, with that season. In this case, again, um, summer is all about, is about fire, about that activity and the passions and the, the flaring out that we not only see in fire, but that we experience in our own, in our own lives. So, with that, with a sort of understanding that there's yin and yang, and there's this idea of something called summer heat, which affects all of us, basically heat and humidity. And then this idea taken a step further into the five elements that we are square in the middle of a season that's associated with heat, we can already begin to understand some of the things that we're most likely to be affected by. And based on our constitution and our tendency towards running hot, running cold, and so on, we can, we can sort of predict and protect ourselves from, from some, of, some of the things that, we, that might otherwise hurt us. So summertime, this is, this is a time of fulfillment. This is a time of expansiveness and growth. Flowers are, are, are blooming. This is a time of 
brightness and warmth and activity, and the whole world is 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 bubbling at this time. Um, the energy that's dominant has to do with with interaction and engagement with each other. We we're we're more active in part. We have longer days, and so there's more time to be active. Like fire, this is a season of passions and exercise and expending energy. And it's a light season. It's a season when things are a little bit easier and we're not endure. It's not quite so hard to manage the elements, except in the extremes of, of the heat. And it's a season of outward activity, of, again, engagement and relationships, and communication with, with ourselves, with one another, exploring new exercises, all of these things. So we nourish our health. We wanna, again, we want to be in harmony with the environment and with the season around us. And so for that, this is a time when we nourish our health by being active, by taking action and doing all of these things. And again, we can see this in our lives. We're naturally inclined to, to be more social as a starter. And, and this is particularly, you know, I was going to maybe talk a bit more about this later on, but this is particularly poignant this summer because we have all come through what has essentially been a really elongated winter or a lot of seasons, in some ways, the other four seasons without the summer, without the expansiveness and the expression and the connection and the activity that we associate with this season. So the summer of 2021 is really special because in so many ways, it's the first time in about two years since we've really had this opportunity to, to really bloom the way the, way the season, season asks us to. Um, the, the days are long, the, 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 the season is one where we seek to realize all of those things that, that we looked forward to doing over the course of, of the previous seasons. And that's one of the things that also makes the summer unique. This is a time that, we've all, that we all look forward to in some ways. There are great things to do during the winter and I can't wait for ski season. And I can't wait for the autumn and the harvest of all the vegetables and stuff that we're growing right now. And there is nothing as wonderful as the spring and just the beginning of things coming up out of the ground. But looking forward to actualizing these ideas and energy and moving it forward, this is the season for it. Predictably, there are some things that we can do that are nourishing with all of this activity, but at a certain point, we can overdo it. We can take it to a point where, in fact, we begin to, we begin to deplete ourselves. So for that, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. One, some of the, some of the sort of lifestyle-y elements that are in sync with the season. And then some of the, some of the stuff that just happens that, that we come up against during this season that we have ideas about in Chinese medicine about how to manage them. First, let's talk about food, okay? Food is obviously a really big part of, of, of our summer activity. Things are growing, foods are colorful. This is really the time to incorporate the, the, the rainbow um, of foods into, into our diet. So there's a lot to choose from during this season. That said, because of the heat, we often have an inclination to, to just cool ourselves down with ice water and ice cream and cold smoothies and things like that. And we have this idea in Chinese medicine that everything that you eat turns into a 100 degree soup, right? Whatever you put in your body, turns into your body, you assimilate it. So if I were to, let's just say, eat an ice cube right now, it would be Noah versus the ice cube and invariably Noah wins. But what we wanna realize is that that effort of, of basically warming that ice cube, that takes work, that takes energy and it takes, and it's a challenge on my digestive system that if it's something that I do periodically, not that big a deal. But if I'm constitutionally already a person who runs a little bit on the cold side, 
if I'm doing it all the time, then this can become an excess of cold that I'm introducing into my body that's changing the way my body works, most specifically my digestive fire. And it can kind of douse that a little bit, become a challenge, can lead to a lot of the digestive problems that we see during, during the summer when we're getting not only ice cream headaches, but stomach aches and, and other digestive problems. Um, ideally, during this season, we're eating cool foods like some salads, quickly cooked foods, lightly cooked foods, nothing that's not an entirely raw salad or raw fruit slash smoothie driven diet, um, but in fact, things that have been lightly cooked. So they're just warmed up a little bit so that we can assimilate those nutrients better. And spices are good during this time of year as well. Um, not excessive, excessive amounts, because as you can imagine, that has its own sort of pitfalls where if you're eating too many spicy foods and introducing too much heat into your body, then that can lead to heat in your stomach and, and discomfort there. And also just more heat on top of an already hot season can kind of burn you out a little bit. Um, it is worth noting though, that in this idea of whether we should eat cooler things like cold to cool us down or other types of foods, it is worth noting that all of the spicy food in the world comes from equatorial regions, comes from places where, in fact, a little bit of spice, not tons and tons of it, but enough to just get a little bit of a sweat going, sort of acts as a way of propagating our body's natural air conditioners. So that's something to kind of take away when we're making food choices, namely that a little bit of sweat is actually a good thing. It's just that we don't want to be pounding ice cold margaritas with tons of hot sauce on something else. Not that I would know from anything like that, but I've seen it done on TV. Sleep is another thing that comes up um, around this time of year. And for most people, it's a pretty easy time because we're able to follow the sun a little bit more, especially in, in the Northeast of the United States where we are, we're not waking up in darkness. And so our circadian rhythms, our daily rhythms are a little bit, are a little bit easier. Rising with the sun, doing a little bit of gentle exercise, kind of getting the day off the ground. Um, it is important, again, in this idea of the moderation that we wanna, that we wanna incorporate into our lives, we wanna make sure that one, we're getting enough rest and we're not just burning the candle at both ends all the time because that is depleting. And again, things I've seen on TV that I know what that can look like. Um, the other thing is some people do have challenges with sleeping during this time because in fact, the sun is coming up closer to five o'clock in the morning and they by definition are not morning people constitutionally. So there are steps that you can take to kind of support what we're looking for and in, in recognizing in this medicine that may help. And those are things that include good bedroom hygiene, making sure that the electronics aren't coming to bed with you at night, making sure that you have either some, that you have some way of controlling light that gets into your room and also making sure that if you can control it, that your room is a comfortable temperature not freezing, not too warm, somewhere in between so that you can sleep comfortably. Another really, really important part of sleep health during this time of year is because we're staying up later, we tend to be eating later. And we definitely wanna put at least minimum two hours between when we eat and when we go to bed. Because when we go to sleep, Sleep is something that we actively do. We go to sleep. We don't just kind of flip a switch and check out and crash from being awake. This is actually an active thing that your body is doing. It's repairing and from what you did that day and preparing you for the next day. So your, your, your activity cycle, super intensive exercise right before bed, eating large meals right before bed. These are things that can definitely kind of affect your sleep and and maybe compromise other parts of your of your health. Even though this is an active time of year, we don't want to lose touch with our our more yin 
practices like meditation, Tai Chi, Qigong, the more slower, less surfy, robust, outside exercise, aerobic activities, right? Even during this time, we want to have a keep a healthy sort of touchstone of stillness. Um, if you don't have a practice, if you're one of those people who's tried meditation or even something more active like Qigong and feels like they they just, you can't stop your mind. You can't focus long enough. Um, there are some great apps out there and there are some great people to, to learn with. Um, we'll try to get a few of those off to you um, in notes that we'll send everybody here after the talk. Um, but the thing about meditation and exercising like this is it's great in a given moment, but it's not always valued just for that moment. We don't meditate on Monday morning just because we want to feel still on Monday morning. We do it because we want to have some kind of grounded element in our bodies for when things go completely off the rails on Thursday afternoon, right? Meditation and stillness and cultivating yin in your body, even during this time of year, is something that we want to maintain and, and work on because we are not just yin or yang. And so even in the depths of the seasons, we want to we want to create that balance of yin and yang. Be somewhat active during the winter, not excessively so, but also not be completely off the hook during during um, during the summer. Um, in terms of exercise, we want to stay active, um, but don't overdo it. Keep tabs on yourself. Certainly make sure that we're staying hydrated and drinking nourishing things as well, like nectars and making sure that your 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 rich foods, um, your rich vegetables like pears and even cooling things like watermelon are are part of the water rich vegetables are are what what we're looking for. Um, of course, drink drink plenty of water because even when you don't realize it, you are, you, we are often kind of sweating it out. Um, trying to think of what else in terms of most general recommendations, nutrition, I was exercise. When you had brought up nutrition and the battle between Noah and the ice cube, which is a movie I would definitely watch. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to avoid cold foods like salad, like, or I guess it's not hard to avoid salads, but sometimes that's just what you have. Are there, is there advice on energetically warming foods that you could pair with cold things to kind of help your body digest them? Sure, absolutely. Um, so that's a great question. In terms of foods, Again, we can look to the sort of more equatorial regions like parts of Africa, Central and South America, India, Southern Asia, places where things tend to be kind of hot and damp a lot of the time anyway. And, and again, the healthy diets are not laden with burning hot peppers, but in fact, just kind of like lit up with, with curries and cardamoms and cinnamons and and yeah, even, even hot pepper sometimes, but in a way that just kind of cuts through the dampness, cuts through the sort of the cloying of the meats um, or other things that we might be eating, the dairy, um, and sort of like helps to, helps to dissipate some of that dampness. Remember the summer heat is a combination of heat and dampness. Um, and that happens digestively as well. One of the places, um, actually, Emma, it's a great question because one of the places where people are introducing lots and lots of cold into their digestive systems is juicing and smoothies because it's a quick energy boost by breaking down the, the matter of vegetables, makes some of the energy within them a little bit more bioavailable. And that energy, even though it's there and sort of warming the juices, there's still, they can be, and certainly if we're introducing like dairy or yogurt into it, they can be a little heavy on the gut. 
Simple answer there that I usually make to people, recommendation is ginger. If you're having, if you're making smoothies regularly, if you're juicing a lot, just put a couple of slices of ginger into that because it doesn't take much. You don't have to like do a one for one balance, but just something that energetically warms it up a little bit. Um, just like the cooking, we don't need to do the slow cook and stewing that we do during the winter, but we do want to sort of like give things a quick grill or warm them up a little bit so that they're just a little easier to assimilate. And when we talk about chi assimilation and energy from the foods that we eat, we're talking about digestive function and nutrient assimilation and tummy aches and gut health, which side note, probiotic, always a good idea, um, especially when we're when we're eating lots of different kinds of foods, we want to make sure that that microbiome is, is robust. I think you're on mute. I am, yes. That was good because you were talking and I interrupted you before. So <laughs> do you think that's why um, with meals like sushi, it's often paired with ginger so that the raw sushi is easier to digest because of the ginger and like miso soup and things like that? So yeah, um, that, that's that sushi and, and Japanese food like that, as well as things that are maybe not as familiar to people um, from, from other cuisines, um, again, including China and India and so on. There, that's, that is an elegant balancing of, of flavors that not only reflect like the different tastes of sweetness and spicy and sour and salty, but balance the one the physiological functions of those of those flavors as well as the thermal functions and i will just take a second to kind of clarify that those five elements that we talked about wood fire earth metal and water each one of them also has a flavor that is associated with it so um so in this case bitter is the flavor of a fire so that's kind of the flavor of, of the summer, which is different than the saltiness, the sort of grounded salt of, of winter that we associate with, with, with the element water um, in that season. In terms of the ginger and more so in some ways the wasabi, um, those are things that can help to to balance balance that up the ginger is is by definition by nature kind of warm and warming the way it's pickled it's actually it's neutralized a little bit and the ginger is considered a bit of a palate cleanser as well so as you go from one one type of sushi or sashimi to another it it helps to sort of clear the slate but it does help to balance those things in your stomach and 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 make that make everything more digestible. Um, the another thing that's incorporated and and the wasabi that's warming that's a flavor, but that also helps manage the raw coldness of the fish and the rice. Um, people often get either something that looks like a mint leaf but isn't quite mint, or a piece of plastic that looks like mint or something that looks like grass. But there's something that is in sushi that is often a, a sort of looks like a decoration that actually is an herb that we use in Chinese medicine as well as Japanese herbal medicine. It's called zisuye. And it is an herb specifically for helping to balance the stomach. It helps reduce nausea. It's, it is a sort of fail safe against food poisoning. Um, when you're eating raw fish. So if you ever do get sushi and you're getting the real leaf there, definitely eat that too. That's so interesting. I feel like I've only ever seen the plastic decoration. So maybe I need to find a fancy sushi place to go visit that will give me the non-plastic version. <laughs> <laughs> Something other than the plastic grass. Right. <laughs> um, you had mentioned some exercises that would be good to incorporate during summertime, mainly in addition to meditation, but also Tai Chi and Qigong. And I wondered, and we can always send things after this in the recap email, but are there specific Qigong exercises that would be good for this time of year 
or like a stretch or a breathing exercise or something in particular for summer? There, you know, there are different, first off, Tai Chi is great. It's it for the way most people practice it is what, what is often referred to as the, the short form. It's a, it's a sequence of moves that are based on different elements and different movements in, that go on within your body and an expression of the channels that energy moves, moves along. So looking into Tai Chi, wherever you are, that would be great. Um, Qigong, which if you don't know, is a gentle physical movement that's based on your breathing. So it's somewhere between exercise on this hand and meditation over here. And it is, a, and it is a rhythmic conscious movement of your body based on, based on your breath. Also fantastic for, for not just this time of year, actually, because Qigong is also connected to the same roots as the medicine itself. Qigong has different practices that reflect not only different parts of your body and different channels, but the elements that we associate with all of this as well, and in turn is appropriate for different seasons. That was a mouthful, but yeah, Qigong is great and everybody should do it. With all of that said, um, probably for a lot of people, the most well, one of the more well-known uh, exercises that's just great to do this time of year in the mornings is yoga, sun salutations. Just beginning with that particular routine, um, what are what's literally called sun salutations, a routine of stretching and waking your body up that actually accomplishes a lot of the things that we're looking to do, namely activate the channels, get your breathing going, get your heart rate up a little bit, nothing too dramatic. It's not like waking up and being halfway through a half marathon as the sun's coming up, um, but it's it's gentle. And it's actually something that once you start doing it with any regularity, it's a little bit of an addictive thing. And you watch how, and it's limited. One of the things I love about sun salutations is it's a limited enough routine that as you do it, you really notice your body changing, your flexibility, your endurance. And it's a really good barometer for how you're feeling. That's one of the things that I, I would definitely recommend is having something that isn't just really young, like how much weight are you pushing? Um, plus sun salutations you can do, like that kind of thing, along with the Tai Chi and yoga, you can pretty much do in on the beach or in a hotel room. That's great. I feel like all of this is a really good reminder for myself and I don't know about anyone watching or whoever will watch this afterwards, but I feel like these are all really good reminders to kind of give your body a break and if the summer is a hard season to get through and not having to force your body to digest extra cold things or exert yourself too much in the gym and just taking it um, in a more peaceful way, I think it's, it's a good reminder. <laughs> it is. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, we talk about connection and we talk about socializing and we talk about expansiveness and energy and all of this great stuff that the summer represents. And that's sort of the nature of the season. And we all know that we've gone through seasons that should is a judgment laden word, but where we would have liked to have felt some way other than the way we're feeling. And there's a lot of pressure on summer. There's a lot of pressure to have gotten that beach bod together. There's a lot of pressure to be able to run that 5K with, with whoever. Um, and again, especially having come out of the quarantine that we've all come out of, there's, there, we're, in, we're not in the same place we were last time we came into a summer like this. And so whether it's the summer and all of this activity and connection and expressiveness or, or any other season, one message that's universal is, is the very yin process, ironic during the summer, but this yin process of self-reflection and, and, and listening to your heart and how you're feeling, recognizing how your body's feeling today and not overdoing it. Because especially during this season, when 
we're in a period that we associate with fire, like fire, change happens really fast. And so if something's going, if you're going to overdo it, you're not going to necessarily see it coming the way you might in, in another season. And that's physically, that's emotionally, that's socially. You know, this is a season when we're going here, we're going there, we're going to this party, we're doing all of these different things. And before we know it, a lot's gone on and we might have overstepped a little bit. So be patient, be kind, be gentle and take, take, you know, work out a way, even if it's once a week to just sort of check in, make sure things are where we want them to be. And if they're not, work on, you know, start to start to explore ways to, to shift gears a little bit. There's no absolutely right way. That's great advice, especially as you mentioned, we're not coming from um, the last season. It's really like an extended winter into this summer. So I can imagine it, it feels like a true statement, maybe every single summer, except for summer of 2020, <laughs> us all overextending ourselves and doing a million and one things and trying to make this a great summer. And it's, um, I'm sure that that pressure is maybe more present for this, the, this summer, comparatively. Yeah, totally. And we see it all around us. You know, we're, we've been pent up. There's a lot of pressure, not just to like get back to where we were, but to get out of where we've been. Yeah. So yeah, a lot going on. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing all of that um, with us. I know that um, I've definitely heard you speak about the energetics of food, for example, but there were certain things that you touched on that I hadn't quite realized. So I'm really excited to push through this summer in a more uh, reasonable way. <laughs> Great, Emma versus the ice cube. Yeah. Um, the ice cube, <laughs> part two. <laughs> well, exactly. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll send um, uh, a link to this recording so you can watch it back and we'll, we'll share some notes um, to recap what we talked about. And if you have any questions, um, let me know and I will try and help you find an answer. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. Great speaking with you. Thanks, everybody, for for coming, and have a great rest of the rest of the summer. And if not before, we'll see you see you next season. Um, <laughs> but enjoy the rest of the evening, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank and thank you, Emma. <laughs> thank you, Noah. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>